next is Mr. Jeremy Mazur, who is also a member of the Board of Directors for the WNHA, and uh, he is currently a master's student at San Diego State University pursuing his degree in history. And he is also a member of the staff of the uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego Command Museum. The Command Museum concept is something that's also peculiar to the Marines, and uh, we hope that Jeremy can address uh, the nature of having command museums uh, in a service. And his presentation specifically is going to be MCRD San Diego and its Command Museum, 100 years of history. So with that, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Carl. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Mazur. Uh, I'm going to be presenting on the MCRD uh, San Diego Command Museum. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I first became interested in museums uh, when I would visit museums with my grandfather, um, mostly in the Washington, D.C. area, going to the Air and Space, uh, Space Museums there, as well as the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Uh, I, in fact, I was lucky enough to see it before it was the building that it is now when it was a few different uh, separate buildings on base uh, in Quantico, and then I saw it when they brought it off base. Uh, I'll get into that in a, in a little bit. But uh, that is part of the reason that made me want to join the Marine Corps. Um, and then I did five years active duty, um, got out, and I'm going to school at San Diego State, uh, working on my uh, grad program. Uh, I'm focusing on public history. And um, I started out as an intern um, at MCRD San Diego, um, working at the museum there. And then I was lucky enough to be able to get a full-time uh, position um, in, for, for the short term as I was filling in for someone who was uh, on orders with the Air National Guard. He was out for a few months, but I've uh, continued to work with the museum uh, for at least three years now. Um, so um, let's see, next slide. So what I'm going to be focusing on today, um, I'm gonna to be talking about background about the base and the museum talking about command museums, uh, the events and activities that we support, uh, as well as the visitors. Next, I'm gonna talk about what we offer as far as exhibits and galleries and unique collections and artifacts. And then I'm going to wrap up by talking about some of the ongoing projects that we have, including oral history interviews, uh, documenting uh, gender integration at MCRD and uh, the recruit history classes. So as far as background, um, of the museum. So the, the base itself is actually located north of Lindbergh Field, San Diego Airport. Uh, in fact, if you, uh, you know, take off or land from San Diego Airport, you probably see it off to the right. Uh, there's a, a giant red sign uh, on the other side of the fence. And then I believe one of the buildings has MCRD um, on, the, on the building. Um, so it was the first Marine base on the West Coast in 1921. There is a push to put um, a Marine base on the West Coast. Previously, uh, the only bases were at Quantico and uh, Paris Island, uh, nothing on the West Coast at that point, and they just had Marine detachments at Navy bases, uh, such as Mare Island. Um, and so um, with the Mexican Revolution in 1910, uh, there's instability uh, south of our border, and they repeatedly sent Marine detachments, um, you know, to, to Mexico. They ended up not landing uh, on the West Coast, but uh, they were offshore for a little bit, um, ended up uh, camp, setting up camp uh, at North Island. Uh, first, it was uh, Camp Thomas, then Camp Howard. And uh, so after this repeatedly happened, um, it was decided that it would really be a good idea to have Marines on the West Coast. And that's where the base started out. Um, so today, what we focus on is, as the name implies, it is a recruit training depot. Um, we also train drill instructors, uh, recruiters, and there's also a Coast Guard detachment uh, aboard the base. Um, the museum itself, uh, it opened in 1987, and it's named in honor of Medal of Honor recipient Major General James L. Day. So command museums, according to the Marine Corps order for the history program, so we have the National Museum of the Marine Corps, that's the main museum for the Marine Corps. But we also have a system of command museums. It's a decentralized system 
Um, but all of the museums kind of look towards the National Museum for guidance. Um, so what the order says is major posts and stations may establish command museums for the purposes of collecting artifacts related to the command's mission, mounting exhibitions related to the history of the command and the Marine Corps, contributing to the professional education and esprit de corps of Marines and contributing to the public's understanding and appreciation for the Marine Corps. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we, we focus on and uh, the scope, um, well, I, I'll focus on that in a, in a minute, but you can see on the left, that's what the National Museum of the Marine Corps looks like today. Um, and then the, uh, on the right is kind of our counterpart on the East Coast, um, MCRD Paris Islands uh, Command Museum. And they do uh, essentially the same thing as what we do, but they focus on uh, recruit training on the East Coast. Now, our museum's mission statement is to provide an educational setting that portrays the legacy of the Marine Corps for the training of recruits and the continuing education of Marines, the functions as a supporting arm to the recruiting effort, and that serves as a bridge to the civilian community. Um, and then you'll, you'll kind of see that in the visitors that we have come to uh, come and visit the museum. What we focus on in the museum I mean, the Marine Corps history goes back to 1775, you know, that's when it was founded. But what we focus on at our particular museum is the Marines involvement in Southern California and supporting the Marine Corps mission since then. So we have a small uh, exhibit on the Mexican War uh, where Marines uh, served. Uh, then there really wasn't a lot of activity until the early 20th century when uh, Marines were brought down from Mara Island and, uh, and we're ready for, uh, for action in Mexico um, if necessary. So talking about some of the uh, events and activities that we support at the museum. So one of the main things that we do, uh, tours. Um, we have this uh, tour that we do for, or there, there's on the training day M5, which means after the recruits have gone through the training process. They've completed the crucible, kind of the culminating event. They actually have a couple of weeks built into the, uh, the, the training matrix now where there are Marines, but they're still under the supervision of their drill instructors on the base. So on the fifth day of that, that's where they come and visit the museum. Uh, previously, what we would do for these tours is we would have docents um, like the gentleman you see in the, the picture below, and they, he would be talking about, uh, you know, Marine Corps history, as well as his own experience, kind of trying to uh, pass that on to uh, these new Marines. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, um, we have not had them on base to do those tours, but this is a crucial enough event that uh, despite the museum being closed, we've actually continued to have these recruit tours you know, we make sure that the uh, rooms are ventilated and we don't do the tours, but we have them walk through the galleries and, and check that out. We also have tours for DI school students. Um, there are schools uh, from off base, you know, that come and uh, they get to check out the museum. Um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you know, uh, you name it, we do all kinds of tours, uh, veterans groups, reunion groups, so on and so forth. The museum also acts as a community space. Uh, we have a, uh, I guess, a large hall uh, on the first deck of the building. Uh, we call that our visitor reception center. And uh, so we have promotions there. We have um, uh, retirement ceremonies, um, graduations for a corporal's course or other uh, PME courses. Um, we have different briefs in our museum's theater. And then during family day, which is the day before, under normal circumstance, of course, day before the Marines graduate, their family comes and, and gets to spend time with them on the base. And that's an opportunity for the families to tour the museum and to kind of see, um, especially with the boot camp galleries and exhibits, uh, they get to see what their new Marine went through uh, over the past uh, 13 weeks. Uh, we also have a setting and the materials for professional military education. We provide support for that. 
and uh, a lot of that is done with our research library. Now, visiting the museum, typically, the, I would say the visitors we usually have in the museum, we have, um, you know, the, the, the recruits, the Marines, um, you know, people aboard the depot. Um, and then we have people who have, who have access to the base. Uh, they may be active duty, they may be retired. They're the kind of person who would come on the base anyway, and they'll usually stop by the museum. That's typically what we get because there's kind of that barrier where um, unfortunately we're not really um, well known to the public because people just see that's a Marine Corps base, we don't go there, but really anyone can come and visit the museum. Um, it, it's um, maybe a little intimidating um, just because you have to go through the gate and you know they, they do all kinds of checks with ID and, and things like that. Um, that's just kind of standard procedure because it is a military base, but uh, it is possible for anyone to come and visit the museum. If they want to do that, it's best that they go in uh, gate five, which is um, right off of Washington Street. That's kind of the main gate. Uh, if they go through there, provide the um, documents that are listed on this page and also on our website, uh, they can go and uh, check out the museum under normal circumstances when we are open to the public. So what we offer uh, here at the museum. So our current exhibits and galleries, we have uh, the Mexican War, early days, which early days really uh, focuses on the founding of the base, uh, the 1915 California or Panama California Exposition, which was to commemorate the opening of the, the Panama Canal. Um, and the, the Marines played a, uh, a, a significant part in that. And that's kind of part of what helped also bring Marines to San Diego. Um, so there was, we, we kind of focus on that. Um, and and we're, we're updating that. I'll get back to that in a, in a minute. But then we look at, um, and that kind of goes up until World War I. We have World War I, World War II, the Women's Reserve during World War II. Uh, there were many women who were stationed aboard MCRD. Uh, fulfilling many, uh, many roles while they were prioritizing sending men overseas. They were doing a lot of um, admin work, um, working on vehicles, things like that. Um, so we have a gallery for that. We have the Korean War, Vietnam, um, four deployed, which really kind of encompasses everything post-Vietnam. Um, we have a recruit squad bay. Um, you know, we, we have a boot camp kind of through the decades, um, medals and decorations, a lot of the ceremonial aspects of the Marine Corps. And then we have uh, different rooms for our firearms and edged weapons collections. So as you can see in the, the pictures um, on, the, on the left, that's just a small, uh, I guess, slice of what we have in our weapons room that we, we call the armory. Um, and it's pretty much wall to wall with um, various weapons that either Marines have used or that uh, Marines have captured um, while overseas. Um, the top right, that focuses on the, uh, the Women's Reserve uh, Gallery. And then on the uh, bottom right, that's in our Vietnam Gallery. And we actually have a, uh, a, a display that is a tunnel, um, you know, and you can kind of see in there just uh, a, a demonstration of how uh, complex the tunnels were. Um, and then the, the close quarters that uh, Vietnamese were in, in those tunnels. Um, and then you can kind of see some of the traps that uh, Marines would encounter, um, you know, with, with, with the tunnel systems. Now, some of the future exhibits and galleries that we're working on, uh, we have a Navy exhibit that's going to be opening in the late spring. And that is more of a focus on the partnership between the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, because, of course, the Marine Corps is uh, part of the Department of the Navy, and uh, we receive a lot of support from the Navy, you know, especially with the Medical Corps and the Chaplain Corps. Uh, and so we have an exhibit that's going to be opening on that. And then we're currently designing a centennial exhibit uh, to celebrate the base's opening in 1921. And we're going to focus on the years 1911 to 1924. 
um, that's kind of covering from when Marines were first, um, you know, deployed to uh, be ready to go to Mexico. Uh, they created the 4th Regiment um, from Marines who were stationed at Mare Island and had them sail down to uh, off the coast of Mexico. And then 1924 is when the, the base was, um, uh, it, it was designated Marine Corps Base, Naval Operating Base, San Diego. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we, uh, we look at. And as you can see in the, the picture um, on the right, that's the base under construction. And those buildings are still there. Many of the buildings uh, that were built during that time are still there today. Uh, some of them, like the power plant, have been taken down, but uh, the Command Museum itself, it's a historic building, and it actually was, uh, it was barracks at one point. Um, and so uh, it, it's pretty cool working in that uh, type of historic uh, setting. Now, some of the unique collections and artifacts that we have in our, our museum, um, we have uh, documents and photos related to the Sea School Command that was aboard the base until um, it was closed in 1987 when the, uh, the transition occurred from have, turning over those duties from Marines uh, to sailors aboard the ship. We also have uh, documents and artifacts related to uh, what, what are referred to as the atomic Marines, Marines that participated in uh, atomic westing, uh, weapon testing, um, such as the USS Curtis during Operation Greenhouse. Um, and then we have... Um, you know, things related to the Navajo code talkers. Additionally, we have um, in our archive the, uh, the base newspaper, the Chevron. Uh, it was published from the 1940s until I think about 2014. Um, they, they transitioned to just posting it online uh, before ultimately just um, now using Facebook uh, and, and Twitter and, and, uh, and things like that which is actually pretty interesting because when we do research in the museum for decades, what we can do is we can go back and look at the Chevron and see what the base was uh, posting about um, a new change to recruit training, for example. But now that everything is a Facebook post or a Twitter post um, and it's not being archived, in the, in the same way as the, the Chevron, how do you go back and find that? Um, you know, sometimes you just have to just keep scrolling through and there's not as easy of a way to, to find it. And that's kind of one of the challenges that we're, we're facing. But um, so we, we also have a propaganda collection. Um, it is mostly uh, World War, or it's World War II through Desert Storm. Um, I would say heavily focused on Korea and Vietnam, but we have books, leaflets, and, uh, and posters. Um, and then we have uh, a lot of artifacts from the wars in the Middle East, um, you know, such as OIF, OEF. And just off the top of my head, I could be wrong, but I think that we may be one of the only museums in the San Diego area to have artifacts on display from those wars. Um, if, if there's others, I haven't seen them. Uh, so may, maybe you don't want to quote me on that, but as far as I know, that is... Um, that's what I've, I've seen. And we have quite a, quite a few of them, um, Gulf War, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. So now I'm going to transition to talking about some of the ongoing projects that we have at the museum. So we are doing a series of oral history interviews. Um, we've done, you know, we focused on interviewing notable Marines and sailors. Uh, in the past, um, I know one of the early projects that I had as I started interning at the museum was kind of looking at the transcriptions of some of these and uh, summarizing them and just kind of looking through uh, interviews with uh, Mitchell Page, for example. Um, but right now, we're kind of having this push on focusing on COVID and integration. So COVID meaning the base's response and the Marines uh, station on the base, their response to uh, COVID over the past year, um, talking about what it was like when the, the base shut down, how they continued to train recruits, even when the other services uh, put a pause on it. 
Um, so we are focusing on that and we're also focusing on uh, integration. Um, I will, I will come back to that in the, in the, in the next slide. Um, but th those are the two main areas that we're uh, doing oral history interviews on. And there's kind of a push for that right now because many of the people who were involved in uh, the planning of those projects or those, um, those issues for, for lack of a better term, they're still stationed aboard the depot and we're trying to talk to them before they, uh, they're kind of scattered in the, in the winds. So as I alluded to earlier, um, integration previously uh, until this year, um, all female Marine recruits were trained on the East Coast. So even if you grew up, um, you know, in, uh, in North Park, for example, um, you know, here in San Diego, and you could basically walk to MCRD San Diego. The policy was uh, all female Marine recruits were trained at Paris Island, South Carolina. Um, the Marine Corps is uh, changing that and they have started, they, they're currently testing it out, um, but they had the first three uh, female Marine drill instructor students go through DI school uh, in this last year. They graduated in December uh, and they picked up a platoon um, this year. And so that they're, they're training uh, with Lima Company and they have one platoon of female recruits who are, uh, who are who are training, um, you know, alongside uh, male recruits. Um, that's new for uh, MCRD San Diego, and so uh, we're we're documenting that through oral history interviews, as well as uh, taking photographs of the DI school uh, class and this first uh, platoon. Uh, we're lucky enough to have um, Chuck Archuleta uh, on uh, on our staff. Um, he, in addition to doing our exhibits, uh, he was all, he's a retired Marine and he was a combat photographer. And uh, so he has that skill. And so he's going out there and he's kind of following uh, both of these, you know, taking pictures of the major events. And then we're going to have that in our collection and um, maybe be able to use that um, in, the, in the future. Now, another thing that we are focusing on is um, Recruit Training Regiment is looking at updating their history classes. They want to make them more immersive um, and, and maybe a little more hands-on um, instead of it just being purely the lecture-based classes that they do right now. Um, they have at least five history classes to do. And then uh, they, part of the graduation requirements is they have this test. With, uh, with a bunch of different questions, not just the history, but that's incorporated in this test. Uh, right now, they go to the museum after they do this test. Well, they're looking at reevaluating it and seeing maybe there's a way that we can have them go to the museum beforehand and maybe be more hands-on with this history um, before they go and take the, the test, kind of have more of an association with uh, the history that is being taught, and uh, it's just more immersive. So we're providing um, support for that uh, with our, our uh, archives and our resources, uh, as well as providing a location for that. So they are testing it out right now, um, but that, that's something that RTR is looking at doing that we are providing the support for. Um, and then another thing that I, I should probably mention is we're also looking at uh, integrating more digital technologies into our, our galleries and uh, and maybe even our, our website. So on our website, we already have, you can do a virtual tour of the museum. Um, but we're looking at using other, uh, you know, digital humanities uh, that, uh, that are becoming more popular. Um, you know, they have more interactive timelines where you can kind of uh, scroll through them, include pictures, so on and so forth. And this stuff that we can create a digital exhibit on our website um, or put something out, you know, embed it in our galleries. Um, there's even more interactive maps and, uh, you know, you can have a digital exhibit that also includes, um, you know, voice clips and, and, and so on and so forth, the videos. Um, and so we're looking at that technology uh, and that's something that uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to be working on. Um, and just kind of seeing what's, uh, what's available there. 
So uh, if you are interested in checking out the museum, um, I would recommend going to our museum. So our, this is actually our foundation's uh, website, but this is kind of our main website as well. You can go to mcrdmuseumfoundation.org. Our director is Joni Schwartzwetter, uh, and that's her contact information if you if you need it. And then if you're interested in doing research, uh, doing research, uh, checking out the resources that are in our research library, uh, I would refer you to our historian Ellen Guillemet, um, and she should be happy to assist you uh, with uh, with what you're looking for. Um, and so, one of the one of the things that I'd like to show you kind of before I conclude this presentation. One of my favorite things that I've seen come in to the museum, uh, this warrant officer, uh, he served through the, from the 70s through Desert Storm. Um, he brought in this roll of toilet paper uh, and on each square, it has printed on it government property, just to, just to remind you, I guess. Um, but we get all kinds of uh, random and unique things that come through the museum. And I, I thought that was just kind of uh, one of the more uh, unique ones that I've seen. So this concludes my presentation. Uh, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And I hope that uh, when we open back up that uh, I see you at the museum. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I kind of, I kind of, um... First of all, let me say, I really regret that I have not yet been to the museum and I intend to correct that when I start leaving my house, whenever, whenever that happens to be, I don't know. Um, but, but my comment, I think it's very interesting the way that the Marines take such effort to bond their new recruits with, with core tradition. And I, I can't think that the Navy does that or the Army or the Air Force. Do you have any comments on that? Do you see that happening with, with recruits? Do you see that they go, oh, okay, this is what I'm part of? I, I think so. Um, and I'm seeing an increased, um, I, I'm, I'm seeing an increase in that. So for example, when I went through in 2010, um, you know, we kind of talked about, we've, we've got these things called um, ditties where it's just kind of uh, this, Repet, uh, repetition of certain facts and and so on and so for example um when i went through we were we were just kind of talking about you know way city you know it was house to house street to street fighting i was out and i witnessed some of the recruits doing a march and they're you know kind of passing the the time by doing these ditties and they're talking about um you know operation uh operation starlight and talking about uh, Chulai and things like that. We weren't talking about specific operations. And so I see kind of a, an increase in um, trying to uh, connect these recruits with, with the history and, and is just getting more involved, um, you know, as, as we go on. So um, I see the recruits go through the museum and, and they kind of there's stuff that they hear about in their classes and then they get to see it in person, you know, after carrying an M16 around for weeks and then they get to see, uh, you know, what an M14 looks like or what, uh, and you know, the, the first version of the M16 looked like. Uh, I see them connect with that. Um, and I, I think that's one of the, the great things, um, you know, that the Marine Corps does. I can't speak to, um, all of the other services because I don't know exactly how they do it. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll say that when I went to my brother's uh, graduation from boot camp in San Antonio, um, you know, they uh, they they had um, you know the Air Force has a lot of historic aircraft out on the field and everything, so they do uh, have that connection to history. But um, I'm not sure that they have the same museum um, type of setting within their recruit training like the Marine Corps does. So this is one of the reasons why there will always be a Marine Corps, huh? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> one other question is, is um, somebody, Bruce, Bruce Rene asked this, how is the museum funded? So the museum is uh, funded through uh, 
O&M funds from the base. Um, we are a part of the base's G3 training and operations. And so that's how the building uh, maintenance costs, uh, things like that are paid for. But realistically, when you look at all the exhibits that we have, there is no way all of that would come from uh, just the uh, j just the basis funding. Uh, so we do get a lot of funding through our museum's foundation, which is why um, donations are, are very important. And so uh, we also get some funding and some uh, support. Uh, especially for some of the, uh, the exhibits, artifacts, things like that from the National Museum of the Marine Corps. So uh, between those two, that's kind of what helped uh, really get the equipment um, th that we need and to be able to print things on plexiglass, for example, or to uh, create you know, uh, a, a new exhibit, get a new case, things like that. Uh, Jeremy? Yes. Yeah, could you... Uh elaborates uh, on the nature of the architecture as uh, they uh, didn't randomly select what kind of architectural style to employ when they were first constructing the base. There was a, a rationale behind it. Could you elaborate on some of that? Sure. I know that the uh, architect of the base was uh, Bertram Goodhue, uh, who also designed uh, Balboa Park here in San Diego. He also designed West Point. Um, you know, a, I think he may have also maybe Liberty Station. I'm not a not a hundred percent, but uh, he's done some some other uh, places. He went with the Spanish uh, mission uh, type of uh, architecture, um, and so that that's where you see uh, that influence on the on the base. Um, and then, as far as setting up the the buildings, um, I don't have a, a map handy, but basically it's kind of like the way that the base is originally laid out. You have almost like a first wave of uh, different offices uh, and workspaces and behind and you know that you have an arcade um, there. And then behind that, you have the barracks. Um, I believe that there were five barracks buildings. Um, and then behind that, you have the power, uh, the power plant, the exchange, laundry, um, commissary, so on and so forth. That's that's the way that it was uh, designed. Um, yeah, it was uh, part and parcel to the Navy Department being very careful in having a light touch when it began to invest in the greater San Diego area around the time of the First World War. And one of the things they did uh, for Naval Air Station North Island, for instance, they consciously adopted local architectural styles for military installations because they were very keen on being able to just blend right in uh, to the this area that was so generous in providing land grants for the uh, installation of the uh, naval services. So uh, MCRD is just another example of how the thinking was 100 years ago that the Navy came to San Diego to stay. Absolutely. And that's kind of part of what we're going to be focusing on in our centennial exhibit, where there's kind of this partnership between the local community um, and, uh, and the, the military leadership. Um, they, they wanted to, they wanted to be welcomed by the community. And so you saw during the 1915 uh, Panama, California expo, you had the Marines there and they, they wanted people to see what the, the Marines were doing. They wanted to uh, show that they were kind of a benefit to the, um, you know, to the community, throwing parade or having parades, and uh, you know, just all, all kinds of uh, things like that. They, there was a race along a car race along Point Loma Boulevard, um, and so Marines were uh, standing guard there, and so they were trying to integrate themselves with the community. And part of the reason that the location for the base was chosen was because uh, Congressman uh, Kettner. Uh, could overlook from his home and he could see uh, where the, the base was. And so uh, since people would be able to see the base, as you said, uh, definitely wanted to make sure that it wasn't an eyesore. Is Jeremy? Yes. Hey, where at uh, North Island was the, uh, was it Fort Thomas, you said? Uh, Camp Thomas and, uh, and then I believe Camp Howard. Where, where was it at on North Island? Um, 
To be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I want to say uh, kind of where the air station is now, but I'm, I'm not 100% on that. So it's under tons of concrete now, All right. Probably, yes. <laughs> so. Yeah, Jeremy, uh, are, is the uh, Flying Leatherneck Museum out at Miramar also a command museum? And do you have any insights into why they're having their funding issues and may close? They, they are also uh, considered a command museum. Um, I, I think I'm going to have to refrain from making any comments on that just because um, I am a, uh, a government employee. Um, but I, I will say that uh, personally, I, I, I really enjoyed the museum. Um, I think that the Marines should be able to, uh, you know, have a museum dedicated to uh, their own uh, aviation history and um, so uh, but I, I think I'm going to leave it at that. I, I, am, I am not a government employee and I will say that if the flying leathernecks disappears that would be a real shame. I mean that is that is just a fun place to go to you can just wander around and and it's kind of relaxing and, and nice little store and everything and and I hope that through some miracle of of God or whatever, that the funds do become available to um, keep that keep that facility open. It's a great place. It is. Any other questions? I have one more question. I'm sorry, but I have just four questions. Uh, how big is your library? I've never been there. How big is it? A lot of stuff in there. Where do you get your books? You're not buying them, are you? <laughs> well, there there are many that are donated. Um, if there's uh, for example, because we're doing the Centennial exhibit, um, occasionally we'll, we'll buy a book um, using uh, money from the foundation. Um, I think one of the books we recently acquired was uh, William Kettner's book, uh, Why and How It Was Done. And it's basically him talking about all the things he, he accomplished while he was in Congress, uh, including bringing the Marine Corps and the Navy to San Diego. And he kind of talks about uh, the rationale behind it, he includes uh, letters and uh, parts of bills that were uh, proposed and passed uh, through uh, Congress. And so uh, that's one of the books that we recently acquired, uh, you know, for that. But a lot of what we have comes in through uh, through donations. And uh, as far as as far as, far as the, the size, um, I'm, I, I couldn't tell you the exact square footage, but I mean, we, we have um, at least uh, you know, I think 10 ranges, uh, or so where, where we have our, our books, you know, um, so it, it's a, it's a pretty decent sized, uh, library uh, in addition to, so those are just the physical books in addition to what we have, um, online in our past perfect system and, and, uh, and so on. Yeah. I, I will, um, want to ask what? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll make one quick comment that we have we have lots of time for questions too. One quick comment that um, San Diego is is for people who don't live here is really a pretty good source for um, for uh, military history libraries because the Veterans Museum has a very good library. I haven't checked out your library yet. Muse, uh, Midway's library is is beyond outstanding when it comes to military history. So there are a lot of research uh, resources here. Just up the road in, in um, Chapman College, you have the um, the Veterans Correspondence Library, and you know, that's really worth checking out, especially if you're writing and you're looking for um, points of views of people who have served in all the wars that um, were fought during the era of postal service, which takes you from 1846 forward. So a lot of, a lot of stuff here, and I'm, I'm really anxious to check out what you got there. I'm so, more questions. Uh, Jeremy, uh, yes. are, your, are your digital archives accessible from outside? That is something that we are working on. Um, currently, uh, there's really nothing available um, on the website. It's not like going on uh, the Library of Congress's website or um, uh, university's uh, special collections website. Um, it's not like that right now. I think that was, uh, that was a goal, unfortunately, due to uh, small staff and um, you know small budget. That, that's something we haven't. Um, been able to do as much of yet, um, but 
we have, uh, you know, we, we have things that have been scanned already and, uh, and our, our librarian, um, you know, usually uh, accommodates people, you know, sending stuff out, things like that. Hey, Vince. Yes, sir. Um, UCSD has a great Asian collection for those of you who, uh, and a lot, I found a lot of military, st military stuff up there. Uh, University of San Diego has one, and I believe SDSU also has a good collection. I can, I can talk about SDSU's library. And, um, you know, Alvin Cooks was the, um, Carl, Carl's professor, as a matter of fact, um, back in the day, was taught at San Diego State for a long time, and he had access to a lot of budget dollars, apparently. I mean, they have a complete sense of social there for uh, Japanese 146 or whatever, 200 volumes, whatever it is. Um, great, a great Japanese collection. So there's a, there's a lot of resources in this town. It's pretty impressive. Okay, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, conclude. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, this was a fascinating uh, presentation 